Well, I welcome you to church, and I'm trusting that God will speak to you during this time that we have together. The last couple of times I've preached, I've talked about the subject of prayer and our struggle with prayer and our need to pray. The sermon today actually has to do with a prayer that's offered for us and for the readers. And I'd like to read that. It's in Hebrews chapter 13, 20, and 21, if you want to turn there. We might even have it up here, too. Hebrews 13, 20, and 21. This is the word of God. Now may the God of peace who brought you up from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him, all glory to him forever and ever. Amen. Well, let's pray together. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. This is quite a prayer. I pray that you would help us to gain some things from it for our lives. I pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work even now in this very room. Uh, silencing the accusations of the enemy, directing our attention and our hearts to you, that you might have your way with us today. That when we leave here today, the fellowship, the singing, and your speaking to us would cause our hearts to say it was very good that we showed up at church today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's a lot of words in uh, verses 20 and 21 here. But really, there's one main request and then a second uh, response to that request. The request is that you might be equipped to equip you and then the prayer to produce in you what is pleasing to God. So that would be like the fruit of the being equipped. Are you with me? Yes. <laughs> I hope I don't look as tired as you guys do. <laughs> so sandwiched, and these truths are like sandwiched in... A whole bunch of other words, rich truths about what God did for us uh, through Jesus Christ. And it's actually kind of the author's way to summarize a lot of the meat in the book of Hebrews. So he could have just said, may God equip you with all you need. And that would have been a level of encouragement knowing, hey, he's praying for us that God's going to equip us. But then he like super expands it in summarizing the truths that we've been studying for months and maybe years for some of you. So how do I know that God is for me spiritually, that he's with me in my spiritual journey? How do I know this? How can I know this for sure that God is for me? So instead of saying, may God equip you, he says... Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you. So there's a lot of stuff that he just rattled off there. Now that, if you understand it, has a lot more substance. There's a lot more bite to it, a whole lot more hope. This is the God of peace who has left his throne to minister to every sin-troubled heart that turned to him even a smidget of faith. I couldn't find that word for spell check, but it's a word. Smidget is a word. 
Romans 16 20 the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet what is God really like that, that's a question that a lot of people ask. what is God like so one of his followers Philip said in John 14 Lord show us the father that's that it that would do it just show us the father and then we'd, we'd get it. And, and Philip was told by Jesus, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? So if we want to know what God is like, and if we want to know if God is for us in our spiritual journey, we, we have to study Jesus. Because Jesus is God come in the flesh. And when he was about to come, the prophet Isaiah announced his coming and called this one wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. So God's like this great peacemaker. God wants you and me who have been warring at him with the sin in our lives to be at peace. He wants us to be at peace with him. God wants us to know it's okay. It's okay. So here's God in all of his glory. Whatever you want to picture, this giant, you know, consuming fire or whatever, and we're trembling. And he's like, I, I want it to be okay with you. I'm sending Jesus to build the bridge for you to walk over. I was trying to share the gospel with a new friend in China when we were visiting campus. And I was asking him to repeat back to me what he understood I was saying. And I didn't use these words, but uh, he said to me, he wanted me to give him an English name, so I gave him the name John. So John said to me, it's like we're, we're on one side of this cliff and God's on the other side. And God threw us a rope. And the rope was Jesus. And I'm like, I think you got it, John. <laughs> I, I think you understand. So, so, true peace only comes from God. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's the rope. It's the only way that you can have peace with God. It's great God. only way to have peace is through Jesus We've gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. So this is the, the saving grace that's given us peace with God. So when he says the God of peace, that's what he's talking about. And then he says, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the resurrection. The resurrection, you know, anybody could say, I'm going to die for your sins or whatever. I mean, anybody could say that. There's probably other people who have said that. But when Jesus came back from the dead, that was like God's seal of approval. That's our guarantee that the cross worked. That when Jesus said we would actually be freed of our guilt and shame, the resurrection is like, yep, God kept his word. That's exactly what happened. Might feel like that some days, might not feel like that some days, but the resurrection's the proof that the cross worked. So you, what you need is new life to have peace with God, or you're just faking it. So if this was like God's spiritual summer camp, here's maybe the news flash. There's no walk-ons. If, if you want to be in the camp, you got to be in. You got you to know Jesus to be in the camp, because anything that he's going to say about equipping is going to be like... It's not going to work for you. Because you need this, this Jesus that God's talking about. You need the presence of him inside of you. To give you life. And to give you peace with God. You can't, you can't manufacture that. So I think it's possible. I think it's really possible. They have a lot of people going to church wearing the team jersey. But they're not on the team <laughs> People do that all the time. It's like, oh, I got a fight against Jersey. You're not on a team. 
might be a fan. <laughs> You're not on the team. So maybe we have a lot of people that are like fans of Jesus, but not on the team. You need to be on the team to have peace with God. You need to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior or you do not have peace with him. Once you, once you do place your trust in Jesus to forgive you of your sins and to give you new life, the next verse says that, that you are like part of the flock and Jesus is called your shepherd. But notice here in this passage that we are sheep of a great shepherd. Now in John 10, when Jesus is referring to himself, he like talked about himself as a shepherd. He says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And what did laying down his life do for you? In Hebrews 1320, it says that he ratified an eternal covenant with his blood. So now we're at the heart of Hebrews. He created a new covenant with man. So before it was like law-based. It was performance-based. You do this, and you do it perfectly, and you will have peace with God. And so the whole Old Testament's proving them to us over and over and over again, that's not working. Rituals, sacrifices, law-keeping gives nobody true peace with God. So what gives us peace with God? Nothing that we're doing. It took Jesus' death on the cross and his blood on the cross created a new way of relating with God. It moved us from performance base to grace base. It was a new covenant. So we now are promised forgiveness. We're promised his spirit. We're promised abundant life. And this passage is saying that covenant, that is in fact now eternal. It's never going to wear out. There's not ever going to be a plan B for getting to God. This plan is the plan. The new covenant is eternal. We need to accept that. We need to live it. Everybody here, when you have downloaded something on the internet, they have this thing that says you have to like accept this agreement. And, and you can read it if you want to, but I'm going to guess that nobody here has like read through it. It's like pages and page. You just keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. So you just click accept and you go on. The guts of that agreement is telling you what they're not going to cover. They are protecting themselves. And so you're signing saying all of these provisions for this company protecting themselves, you're signing on for. So that if something happens, they can go back, ah, and a fine print. You, you clicked. It says right there that you agreed. So they're making sure that the company is, is promising you very little. So when you get a warranty, same thing, you pull this thing out of the box, and it's in 400 languages, and, you know, it's basically this little part that says, this is warrantied for one year, and then the whole rest of that part for you and your language is telling you what is not warrantied. This and 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 this are not covered, and if you do this and this and this and this, and if you live a normal human life, it's not covered. <laughs> okay, so basically, that's your one-year agreement, and so they're telling you what is they're not promising for or to be liable for. So a little teeny part and what's covered, giant part, what's not covered. Same for insurances, your house insurance. They got this whole page after page. Not liable for this, not covered for that. Some disclaimers, <laughs> they actually give you so that you know that this product is going to hurt you, but... We've told you, so it's okay. Have any of you ever gone to a store and bought one of these off clip-ons? You know what I'm talking about? You put these batteries in it, 
and you, you put it on your belt and you walk around and these batteries heat uh, a element inside that's got a, a pad of, of chemical on it and then it it produces a vapor that surrounds you with this shield so there's this air around you now that is protecting you from mosquitoes turn it around and read the back of it I went and bought one of these and my wife made me take it back <laughs> I'm not kidding you on the back of this thing it says hazards to humans and domestic animals and then below it there's some writing and one of the first thing that says is harmful if inhaled <laughs> so I'm gonna go out and work in my backyard okay take me about 20 minutes I'm gonna clip one of these babies on turn it on the vapor starts I'm gonna go <gasps> how's that gonna work I'm not done avoid breathing the vapor if inhaled if the person's not breathing, call 911 or an ambulance and then give artificial respiration, preferably mouth to mouth. How, how do you do that if it's not mouth to mouth? I'm not sure, but what's up with that? So if you complain, they're going to go, we told you. We told you. Our hands are clean. Can I just tell you that God's not going to do that to you? Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You are offered an eternal covenant. Leave here, go home, working in the garage, smack your finger with the hammer, and out comes a swear word. Eh, sorry, you're going to hell. That was in the fine print. <laughs> He's not going to do that to you. God is promising you that your salvation is dependent upon the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And you are offered now God as your eternal father. Jesus Christ is not just any old shepherd. He's a great shepherd. And he's going to shepherd you through your life from now until he embraces you in heaven. You have a great Lord and Savior. And this covenant is, yes, eternal. And it was secured by nothing less than his blood dying on the cross of Calvary. It wasn't some Mickey Mouse little agreement that you're signing. In fact, when God made his promise to Abraham, they did something very weird. God made Abraham cut these animals in two, and he placed part of the animals on this side, half, they split them, and then the other half of the animal went over here. Can you imagine that? Blood and guts everywhere. And then it says in Genesis that Abraham went into a deep sleep. And God appeared like a fiery smoking pot. And God's presence passed between those pieces. Because God had just made the Abrahamic covenant. He had just made promises to Abraham. And then he told him to do this goofy thing. But when we study archaeology, we find out what that was, was a cultural covenant of their day. It's called a suzerain vassal treaty. And when a treaty was made, there was either bilateral treaties or unilateral. So a bilateral treaty would be if two countries were fighting and they stopped, they would do the animal cut, and then they would both pass and meet in the middle. If it was unilateral, if like one country crunched another one, then the winner would just stand there and they would cut the animals and the loser would walk through. Because what those animals meant was, we have now made this treaty between us. Promises have been made, and if you do not keep your end of the bar bargain, may you become like one of these animals that was halved. Do you realize what that means? Do you get it? God is saying to Abraham, I have promised you 
certain things as the living God. And now I'm going to put you in a stupor so you cannot walk. And God's presence walked between the pieces. And God is saying, I have made promises to you, Abraham. And if I do not keep those promises, may I cease to be God. It's a very serious thing. And Jesus Christ made promises to you. He didn't have some imagery of animals have. Jesus was slaughtered on a cross in time, space, and history outside of Jerusalem to promise you an eternal covenant. It's incredible. God is a promise-keeping God, and you are on his heart. And so he could have just said, oh, I'm praying that God will equip you. And so he threw all this stuff on the front end. So the people reading this would get what you're now getting and they'd go, wow, what an incredible God we have. What incredible promises that he has made to me. This God is for me. So now let's talk about how God equips you for the game of life. The Greek word for the word equip here comes from a root which is ex artizo. And this may sound like a weird word to us, but to their ears, this would have actually been a familiar word to them. To doctors in this day, this word was used for setting bones. Broken bone, take the two bones, put it together. Exertizo. Healing broken bones. To fishermen, this was used for mending a torn net. Fishermen needed their nets to catch fish for their livelihood. Got big holes in them. You need to stop and spend time mending the nets. Exertizo. Sailors use this to refer to outfitting a ship. They're not going to go out there for months on end and just wing it. They're going to prepare and they're going to outfit this ship to get ready to go. Exertizo. Soldiers use this word when they're equipping an army for battle. We're not just going to rush into the battle. We're going to get all of our equipment ready. We're going to get our soldiers ready. And that getting the ready part is exartizo. That's this word. That's the word that he picked to use here. And so our great shepherd, our spiritual coach, wants us to know that he is equipping you for life here on earth and preparing you for eternity in heaven. So he's the one. Amen, who wants to come and set the broken bones in our souls so that we can live a whole life again. He's the one who wants to repair our nets so that we can influence other people for Jesus Christ and be fishers of men and women. He wants to come and equip us for battle so that we're not destroyed in the storms of life. He wants to mature our lives and to equip us so that we can fulfill the latter half of this prayer to do what is pleasing to him to produce fruit in our lives in keeping with repentance? So how does he do that equipping? Well, I had a professor at seminary, Dr. Warren Wiersbe, who kind of traced this word, and he came up with a few things that could be very helpful for us. You could call them coaching calls uh, on the field to become equipped. The first one would be, we need to be reading God's word. 1 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, and correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good word. There's our word. There's our word. So God will use his scriptures as the main way that God will speak to you about what he wants, what we could stop doing or begin doing or how we could influence people or how our lives might be encouraged. We're going to be bound up and strengthened and equipped and, and have uh, all that we need in our ship and have our armament ready for battle. And all of these uh, illustrations can be fulfilled as we soak ourselves in God's word. So I have to ask you, are you reading the scriptures? You know, maybe try like a chapter a day. Pick up one of these daily breads that we give out for free and it will guide you. We need to be in 
reading the Bible. If we're too busy to read the Bible, we are too busy. Someone has once said that reading the holy book will keep Satan from you or Satan will keep you from the holy book. We need to read. We are a visual people. Maybe you want to listen to it on your phone or have it scrolling by you, speaking to you while you're on the elliptical machine. I do that one. Get it in you. Read the Word of God. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges thoughts and intentions. This is what judges thoughts and intentions. Not your culture. Not the things that you're listening to. Not the music. Not those movies. They're not all bad. There's some redeemable stuff. It might be good to watch a movie and go, okay, so how does this align with the scriptures that's actually judging thoughts and intentions? And use that as your standard. I've got to ask you, what is your standard today? Our standard is slipping away. And we're being absorbed into the culture. So allow God's word to equip you. Second one is prayer. This particular usage, though, is prayer to, to allow other people to minister to us or that prayer that we would minister to other people. I'm going to 1 Thessalonians 3.10 where Paul says, As we night and day keep praying most earnestly, we, we can just stop there for a moment and go, <laughs> I mean, who's doing that? Do you have some people on your heart that really need encouragement? Are you praying for them night and day? It is not a Christian acceptable solution to say, well, that's just a real bummer. <laughs> we got more than that, beloved. We can pray to the living God night and day. We pray earnestly for you, asking God to let us see you again, that we may complete what is lacking in your faith. I, I really like, okay, the word complete is our Greek word there, but I really like the New Living Translation. I'm going to read that one to you now. I love that translation. Night and day, we pray earnestly for you, asking God to let us see you again to fill the gaps in your faith. So complete and fill the gaps is this exartizo. We need to do life together. If you're trying to do your Christian life in a vacuum, that is not a good thing. Because Paul is going, we're praying to be able to get our hands on you so that we can fill the gaps in your faith. So we're all got gaps, okay? Can you say that with me? I have gaps. Here we go. I have gaps. I know that was very hard for some of you control freaks, okay? We have gaps in our life. We need other men and women speaking truth into us. We need them to help fill the gaps so that we can believe truth, we can speak truth, and we can live truth. Who are you praying for to help encourage and fill the gaps? And the third one is the local church. Local church is designed by God, primary tool for equipping you. You'll be incomplete without it. So your friend, nobody here would say this, but your friend who goes, my deer stand is my church. I do a church in the boat out on the lake. Okay. Well, you're going to learn really quick from Ephesians that that's not going to work to equip you. You maybe can pray to God on the lake and in your deer stand, but it is going to take interaction with a local body of Christians to fill the gaps and to complete you. Ephesians 4.11 says, He gave some as apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers to equip the saints, there's our word, for the work of ministry 
for building up the body of Christ. So the verse teaches that if you're trusting Christ as your Savior, you are a saint. You don't have to like die, wait a few hundred years, and have somebody vote you in, all right? <laughs> Paul's saying, if you're a Christian, you're a saint. You are in with God. You are genuinely new. Like when a baby's born, before there wasn't a baby, conception happens, you got a baby. Baby's born, oh, here's a baby. But, but that's not all that there is for that baby. Baby's going to grow, mature. So Paul's going, when you became a Christian, you genuinely a new person. But you need to grow up and mature. And to do that, he's saying, you need a local church. That's God's plan for you, to grow up in a local church. So he's saying, in verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, chapter 4, 13, and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You and I need a local church to grow. So you may be no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. As a culture, that is happening. <laughs> we got lots of crafty schemes going on in our culture. A lot of crafty spiritual cunning going on. Ripping people off financially. Guiding them down a path theologically that is not true. Being jerked around. We need a local church that can help us be equipped. That can help us primarily identify and live in our identity in Christ grow in the knowledge of God's word and have a safe laboratory to actually live that out. And I am praying to the Lord Jesus Christ that this church will be that church for you and other people. Amen? We want to be that church. Verse 15, chapter 4, Ephesians, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who had us Christ. So that's our goal. The church is given to us so we can mature, so we can grow up. And what is the fruit of that? Well, that's what he says in Hebrews 13, 21. He wants us to produce fruit in our life that's pleasing to God. And that may be happening in our lives in part, but if not, that's where local church can come in. We can be like iron sharpening iron in one another's lives, in our meetings, in the teaching, in our small groups, men's and women's, in our youth and college ministries, iron sharpening iron so that we can get it so we can grow and mature in our faith. Do you all know our motto? Our motto as a church is that together we are a people loving God, growing in Christ, and sharing the gospel. Can you say that with me? Together we are a people loving God, growing in Christ, and sharing the gospel. I believe with all of my heart that those things cannot happen with the intent that God has designed without us being part of a local church. And I am so glad that you are here. And I am so glad that I can walk with you and do life with you to see this purpose of God fulfilled in our lives. God is on a mission to equip us. He means to equip us together to live our lives together that bring him praise and glory. Amen. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. I'm going to pray. God in heaven, hallowed be your name. I pray that you would be equipping us, but that we wouldn't start just taking off and trying to do that in our own way without a divine plan. No team player would do that in a game on the field. You have given us a very clear plan that you want to use your word, that you want to use fellowship with you in prayer and interaction as team members in a local church, equipping us to live the game of life through thick and thin, through life and death, that we might be able to influence men and women for Jesus Christ. Would you bless us, Lord? There's a lot of great ministries unfolding in this church and a lot of incredible plans for the very near future. And I pray that you would empower us to be that people who are learning to love you together 
that we could grow up together and that we would see that there's so many people that need the life-changing power of Jesus that we would share the gospel together. Thank you for the encouragement of this author from Hebrews that you have provided for us a new covenant to change us and to help us live out the freedom with which you have purchased through the blood of Jesus. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand together.